The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the opinions of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. So, wow. Today's episode was really special for me. The three guests exchanged virtual studio hugs. They really did. Appreciating the way that their companies share this larger mission, we talked about self-care companies that are authentically and holistically behind efforts to advance health outcomes in the most inclusive way and in communities across the nation. They want to make a difference, and it is awe-inspiring. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Chippa Chat, conversations in the consumer healthcare industry with Anita Brickman. Welcome, everybody. We are talking about multicultural marketing today. We have some luminaries, and I don't say that lightly, true luminaries from Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble to talk about how marketing has changed to really focus in on different communities. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We have Michelle Goodrich from Johnson & Johnson, Regina Shipman, and Dwilet Montgomery from Procter & Gamble. Ladies, thanks for being here. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, let's let's talk about (laughs) Band-Aids. Let's Let's talk talk about about Band-Aids and multicultural marketing and skin tones and how Johnson & Johnson decided to do this brand extension. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I'm really um, proud and excited to share a little bit about our um, new Band-Aid R-Tone products, which is, I think, the ones you're referring to. Um, We just launched it to market. If you haven't seen it, it's a new collection of um, bandages that come in shades of brown that we believe really embrace the beauty of diverse skin tones. So we're excited about it because it's not only a great, relevant product for many consumers. Um, And we did this based on tons of insights work and really trying to get the tone right um, of the bandage, the messaging tone right, but also, you know, what does the what does this product stand for? So in addition to the product, we're really proud of two things. One is that we're donating um, lots of product to the community, to healthcare professionals, frontline workers, and specifically communities um, where they may not have access to it. And the other thing we're super proud of is, you know, we recognize that um, only one in 10 nurses in the United States is black which is really just a startling um, you know, statistic. So we are very proud that we've established this partnership with nurses and a commitment to nurses. So we have a partnership with um, the National Black Nurses Association as well as the um, Students Nurses Association. And we're providing um, support um, both in support of their organizations, but also contributing to scholarships. That is so exciting. Can I ask how you guys landed on the skin tones? Sure. I mean, long process. I'm sure our our Band-Aid scientists would give you a a much more interesting story. Um, It's just, it was really just through in connection with our consumers, making sure that what we were developing, one, had the efficacy of the bandages that we wanted, but really reflected the skin tones that mattered. And so, you know, we couldn't have 2,000 shades of bandages, but what we wanted to do was make sure that it was represented across the spectrum. Um, It was really designed for different shades of, of brown and yellow, I can tell you the the lightest shade is a perfect match for my Chinese skin. So, you know, I think it really speaks to a a lot of different cultures. And, you know, the other thing, Anita, that's important is that this was really, really a deep insights journey. You know, it wasn't just something that like we, you know, the team did in a short amount of time. And it was done with, in partnership with the uh, Black community, but also with a Black-owned culture-driven digital agency. So everything we did was really from the beginning, um, really came from the insights and also um, living into the true representation of who we were serving. And clearly this is representative of the corporate social responsibility of Johnson & Johnson. Does it also make business sense? Absolutely. I mean, uh, we, our product should represent the families um, that we serve. That's it. It's as simple as that. And, you know, J&J, just like Procter & Gamble, has always been committed to making sure that our products represent those we serve, um, not just in the products, but I think what's really different now, it's also in, you know, our purpose. 
And so what do we stand for? Um, um, you know, what do we say? How do we show up? It's not just in the product. It's also not just in our messaging or advertising anymore, but it is incredibly important that we speak up and speak out about some of the racial and social injustices and our brands give us really, really authentic and compelling platforms to do so when it's appropriate. Regina Dwyla, do you think things have accelerated in 2020 given current events? Um, and I'll start. Um, I will say absolutely. Uh, I will say for P&G, Procter & Gamble in general, the journey started, I'll say, before the events happened. Um, specifically for what Dwilette and I, we co-lead what we call the Bridges Program in really ensuring that all communities are, are well engaged um, with our brands and we are building more of the diversity in culture um, internally as well as external. So it's really bridging the gaps. And we started this journey, I would say, long before all of the events that have happened over the past year. Um, but of course, with more heightened focus and acceleration within this um, process due to those events. So starting with some piloting processes that Dwilette and I have been involved with, with Metamucil particularly, um, we did some pilots, but then from that pilot, it spent off to be more of the culture norm. And so with that norm and really making sure that our brand um, advocacy um, is reaching all targeted community areas. That has been been the focus point, I'll say, at least for Dwilette and myself since 2017. Dwilette, anything you would add to that? You know, I think you summed it up beautifully. The only thing that I might add is that it brings me a particular amount of joy, a specific amount of joy to be able to share outwardly the culture that we enjoy within Procter & Gamble. We're very sensitive to each other's cultures. We're very sensitive to diversity. We respect it. We embrace it. And now we're just fortunate enough to have a platform that the community can see how much we embrace them as well. Let's talk about Metamucil as a case study. How was this different than how you've marketed it in the past? And what did that make as far as like a difference as far as market share um, uptake in new communities? Let's talk about that. Okay, do I let you want to start? And then I can we'll flip flop. We have fun. Sure. With Metamucil, what we noticed at first is that there was not a lot of intentional promotion and advertising to people of color. So that's one of the things that we made it a point to, you know, bring that to the brand's attention. And we were grateful that they were so receptive, right? So that was the that was the one thing. In terms of the brands being open and receptive to our ideas, another another win. What we did is we actually created activations and opportunities to directly engage with the consumers and pass along the education that the brands had always had in place wanting to get down to them, but there was some barrier, some block. So we were able to bridge that gap and help to um, get the information flow out. Now, in terms of business, of course, as the consumer becomes educated and they embrace the product, there's an uptick in the business. And I'll let Regina speak to those. Yes. And, and to piggyback off of what Dwalette stated, I will say the very first interesting um, point or, or factor that we had to add in is what does the data say? And so we, we have to be able to go to understand to the data to understand exactly where those barriers or disparities are. And so, um, in order to really target the right community and really, um, build brand ambassadorship within the community, we have to really understand. And I think understanding the barriers really will help you to deliver the goals that you want to deliver as a business. Um, um, so understanding why I'll call it the African-American community was not taking Metamucil. So of course, all of us on this line would probably have some of the same um, answers, you know, even as a multicultural um, audience just right here, we thought Metamucil was about laxatives, right? And mm -hmm. really not having the the background or the education around the, the product itself really caused the business not to progress in the AA community. So the more we educated ourselves internally on the data, the more that we educated ourselves on understanding what the community um, thoughts or understanding of our brands was about, we were able to mitigate those issues and close that gap. And so when we went into the community overall on a bigger scale, we were able to really target specifically what the, the thought process was and really 
drive more meaningful um, activation around literacy of no, it's not a laxative, but it's all about fiber intake and how fiber really works in the body. And then how the advantages of fiber really, really help the community in so many health um, conditions. And so just learning those simple key low factors, um, we were able to really drive more scalable pilot activations, which the community is now all in. So mm -hmm. the result of that is the AA community, which we did the pilot on, they were the lesser or even the bottom, I'll say, of the scale um, when we started in 2017. Now they're over-indexing, over 100 plus percent, they're over-indexing within all cultures. Ladies, you're all talking about data-driven decisions for business. Michelle, like how has Johnson & Johnson evolved with the data that you've collected and how you market to your consumers? Well, thanks, Anita. Well, first of all, um, th I'm learning a ton about Metamucil. So mm -hmm. thank you, Dwilet and Regina, and um, just amazing comments on on the approach there and impact. You know, in terms of, you know, th the use of data, I really echo what Regina said, because everything starts with understanding insights and data, um, and then really addressing those need gaps that exist in our community. And, you know, how can companies like J&J &J and P&G and others really make an impact? So as Johnson & Johnson, you know, our, our, our commitment in, in the world is around making a difference in health outcomes, and it's no different here. Um, the difference is that we're laser focused, and I would say, just like Regina said, a heightened focus after the events of this year yes. to really focus on what are the opportunities in specifically communities that historically have been excluded or not had access. And so how can we improve outcomes by investing in culturally competent community-based care? And then how do we focus our towards those communities and our resources and strengthen our relationship with the medical community? So just an example, um, Anita, even brands like Listerine, Listerine that we all know as mouth Gosh, yep. right? Well, guess what? Through COVID, that's actually become even more relevant because people are very, very aware and have a heightened sense of hygiene and health. And by the way, or our, our, our oh, total health and well-being starts yes. with the mouth. Yes. And so we're focused on oral health. And But here's what the data tells us, is that there's still um, a gap between, you know, access and penetration in the Black community, Hispanic communities. And so we're really using that data-based approach to identify communities in need and how do we deploy education, samples, and just relevant messaging to bring the product um, not only um, to be more accessible, but more relevant um, to, to create that, um, that need, to address that need gap. The other thing I would say is we realized through Listerine, which is interesting, speaking of the data, is that if you look at the care model and you think about the underrepresentation of black dentists and dental hygienists in the field, that means that Johnson & Johnson, we have an opportunity to make a difference, not just through the product, but investing in building a diverse pipeline of and scholarship programs to support black dentists and dental hygienists. So that's another way we're really trying to support and advance. If the I effort. can hug you, Michelle, I will reach through. The <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And yeah. I'm all just nodding <laughs> away like furious. Like, I love seeing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will hug you right back. <laughs> Gina, we were talking about even like oral, you know, oral health toothbrushes and like where they're sold. Let's talk about that. Oh, very, very good point. Um, and it goes back to what Michelle uh, stated around accessibility. Um, so when you understand your community, you understand where they shop and even more so the why. And I often start, start any conversation of really driving change with why. And if you don't understand the why, you will never really address the need. So if companies um, are really trying to really build a more diverse platform, your products have to be diverse in the market area as well. And I think that that is some of the silo that you're feeling in why some products are being marketed in more of the non-AA base or Hispanic base versus the AA shopping consumer. So that's just my take. There's just one other little piece that I would like to talk in, uh, toss in, and it's the access that the dentists themselves get to the information. 
right? There are some gaps there. There are products that are new to market and sometimes products that have been out for a while. And if the gap hasn't been closed and if those dentists aren't receiving that information and understanding the science behind it and why they should prescribe it or recommend that their um, patients go out and buy it. And if the patients don't buy into the why, right? And if it's not accessible to them, to Regina's point, then it's, a, it's just a loss. So if we do a much better job of closing that loop and making sure that everyone gets the education that they need to make an informed decision, I think that a lot of our companies and the brands will be excited about the results. So as you all know, CHPA has such a broad membership and there are huge companies, juggernauts like yours, so not saying that lightly, they are, <laughs> you guys are juggernauts, <laughs> but what about the smaller brands, the smaller companies, what can they learn from what you're doing now with multicultural marketing versus kind of that one size fits all approach to selling products? Because this that that's the beauty of an association is that we can be a community and learn from each other. You know, I can start, but um, I, I think this will be a great conversation. You know, um, I think two sides of the, the fence there. One is, you know, I think it starts with a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion as a company. You know, regardless of what size you are, that commitment to your own employees to drive the awareness and education um, and promote equity, not just diversity and inclusion. I, I think it all starts there. Um, on the product side and all the solutions that we represent in self-care within CHPA, um, I think it's actually pretty straightforward. I think one is you, you it's, it's a hum, completely different shift on how we think about our audiences. You don't start with the general population and do a, a, a follow-on campaign for the Black audience and the Asian audience and the Hispanic audience. That's old school market, multicultural marketing. What you do is you really do what Regina and Dwight said so eloquently, which is you start with understand with the data and insights and just taking a look at who really are your consumers that you serve, understanding what their needs are. And I think we'd all be amazed to find where there are disparities um, and opportunities. And then it becomes being relevant, being authentic, um, and developing not just solutions, products that are relevant to the consumer, but the messaging and, um, you know, how can we give back to the community? So regardless of size of company, our responsibility in this industry is to do the right thing and to advance health outcomes. And so, again, small or big, we can all do it in our own Michelle, way. Michelle, you are amazing. <laughs> you are. I agree. That was beautiful. <laughs> this is yeah. a so big beautiful. love fest, ladies. <laughs> yes, every time she talk, I just get excited and thoughts just start to flow. And I will piggyback off of Michelle. One of the most amazing things that I will say um, is a part of Bridges that I found anyway to be amazing is relationship. Yeah. Right. And I say that in the context of if your organization is not diversified and the internal cultural relationships are really not driving the what and the why to the product. You're already setting yourself up as a company, whether big or small, you're already targeting such a specific group just because of your culture inside. So your culture inside should mimic what you're trying to reach outside. And so what we have learned, I believe, is the more that our leadership have now acknowledged that there are opportunities and we need people that look like the communities that we are targeting to really become a part of the internal team. Now we can have the right talk. Now we can drive the right solution and then we can partner and build relationship externally. The reason why I say that is because especially, and I can speak from the AA community, the way that we relate to one another may be different for other cultures, right? So for African Americans, we have a trust factor. I mean, we are easy to trust. And I'll say that for myself. And the more I trust because of people engagement, because of people that look like me, talk like me, even like what I like, right? So we are able to easily captivate the community's 
um, attention because now we have an, an internal culture that embraces all cultures that we can relate to. And so the relationship is critical no matter the size of the company. But if you have a stagnant company with only one culture, you're only going to deliver your product to that same stagnant community outside of your company. So I always say, look at the man in the mirror type process. The more you see yourself in the mirror inside is what you're going to duplicate outside. And I'll leave it as that. Um, do I let anything you want to add? I would just um, encourage companies to think about the experience that their customer or their consumer is going to have once they actually engage with them. And we'll just go with the easy thing. Think about your website, right? If you're out targeting AA or African ancestry, what type, and you, you snared my attention, what type of experience am I going to have as I interact with your brand online? Will I see people who look like me? Will I see things that resonate with me? And if I don't see that, then I don't feel welcome. And that's going to impact how I decide to do business with your company. And if I could get large and small companies just to pay attention to that one little thing, I would be happy. And I think our consumers would be too. It would be a more welcoming, inclusive experience all around. That is so exciting. So now, Michelle, since it's informal, I'm going to put you on the spot. Incoming board chair, sure. <laughs> leading CHPA, the first woman in a, well, ever, <laughs> which is a little hard. <laughs> but what, what's your vision for all of these companies, this community of self-care companies that truly are, I think, passionate about helping people have happier, healthier lives, right? So what do you want to accomplish in this leadership role, not just at J&J, &J, but across the industry? I mean, this is um, no pressure, but it's a great opportunity. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Anita. It certainly is not only a great opportunity, but a real privilege uh, to serve in this role. Um, and I do so not just on behalf of um, Johnson Johnson and the other companies, um, but of all the leaders out there that believe that what we're doing makes a difference. So I, I'm really excited about the opportunity because I think our industry and self-care in general is more important to consumers and families now than ever. And I think the COVID um, pandemic has only really accelerated and empowered consumers to take on self-care for themselves. And I think the industry as a group uh, regardless of where we work, we have a huge responsibility to help drive health outcomes. At the end of the day, it's all about making that impact. And importantly, what it's included in that, to me, I'm very passionate about making sure that we're addressing um, any healthcare disparities where we can, as a company, together more than individually, come together to actually make a marked difference in in addressing healthcare disparities and improving health outcomes. I really believe that this is a huge opportunity for us. And, you know, again, it's the power of the one plus one equals three effect. You know, we are going to be stronger and more influential as an organization together as an industry. Um, forget our brands, but as a common voice. I also um, just want to take a moment to comment that I believe very much in what Regina said is that we are as good as our representation. And so, you know, I, you know, something that I really look forward to collaborating with the other companies about, about how we improve our representation across our CHPA member associations and ensure we're giving great opportunities for diverse leaders across our industry um, to play a role in, in the efforts that the industry is taking on. And Regina, I was thinking about, you know, the historically Black colleges and universities. You really utilize that as the influencers, as Michelle is saying. It's like we need to go into the community with people who resonate already. Absolutely. Um, I think that advertisement is so diverse in itself and how we do it. Um, and I think we need to continue to expand for companies on how we think about marketing strategies. And, and before, I think, you know, we will look at television or commercials, um, right. whether it be radio and TV as the only outlet for the major outlet. Whereas I think that COVID has driven a different, more um, important marketing 
um, process, meaning we have our influencers and they can be from those that are in Hollywood, but then you do have your more, say, grassroots type in, in influencers at like the historical black colleges. So we're starting to tap into how do we start to work within the Hispanic area, utilizing their schools, their specific focus schools and their communities. And then you have just even um, the ordinary everyday people like you and I. So Dwilette and I was on the doctor show. And so our communities got to see, and, and by word of mouth, I, I'm saying, word of mouth travels faster probably than what you will pay millions of dollars for in a commercial. So because Dwilette and myself, um, just ordinary people in the community, but then we have families in, in state cities and states that we represent, word of mouth travels so fast for Metamucil, I believe that that probably was just as much influential as having a million dollar commercial. So I think that we need to start tiering marketing and to help drive the bottom line, it's going to have to be all levels of marketing schemes versus just a commercial newspaper and radio talk, but having right. all of those categories. You know, one of the things that I found that was interesting, um, an interesting outcome of our work with HBCUs is that they actually wanted to partner with us to get the information so that they could share it with their students, with their alumni and their supporters. And I thought that was simply outstanding. And that's not something that you can buy, right? You have to go into that with clear intention. You have to go into that with a plan that both parties agree to. You mm -hmm. have to be transparent. You have to extend trust. And because we extended trust and they extended trust, look at how we were able to educate and inform the community. Because it's more than about just taking Metamucil. It's about heart disease. It's about obesity. It's about high blood pressure. It's about stroke. It's about all of those things and the things that you can do to take care of yourself to help you to avoid those outcomes. Not saying that Metamucil will do that, but there are benefits to um, taking fiber. So I go back to what I was saying, the importance of trust, the importance of being authentic, and the importance of relationships. So closing out this episode, I am inspired about soul care as well as self-care. And ladies, thank you so much for joining us on Chippa Chat. Thank you for joining us here at Chippa Chat. For more information and to hear our entire catalog of shows, please visit chpa.org. 